three people out of all of Canada were selected to go to the highest court of the United Church. And at that time, there were no Native people involved in that hierarchy structure. And so I remember people looking at us like, how did you get here and who let you in the door? What are you doing here? We had a mission after our people gathered together, which we called the All Native Circle Conference. And we were there to uh, bring concerns to the United Church from our people. And I remember talking with Stan and Thelma the night before we were to go in front of the uh, session that there was what they call their blue book with rules and regulations and resolutions and everything that corporate businesses have that tell us what their mission is for people. And there was a list that they promised to do for the Native people, and I said, have you done this, 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 this? No, 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 no. And so I remembered what my grandfather said. God has a purpose for you, but we don't know what it is yet. All of a sudden, I remembered that I need to ask the United Church of Canada to apologize. I hadn't discussed this with Dan or Thelma. I merely told them that I would ask for an apology, and they were astonished, to say the least. I think if we had discussed it, it would not have happened. But because it was to happen, we let it go with that. And so that's what I did. And I remember the looks on the faces of people that were involved. The older people of the structure were very angry. How dare I ask them to apologize? The younger generation of people were very, um, not only interested, they were willing to listen and maybe think they did have to apologize. And because they did that, other churches followed suit. And then the ball got rolling. Our people were very faithful people. We had a connection with the Creator and the land. But we were also people in pain. We were hurting. And when I worked with my cousin Bobby Joseph 30 or 40 years ago, we talked about what happened to our people in residential school. That's when I learned we are hurting people because we were hurt in residential school. And so, because the churches were involved, I thought they should take responsibility as well as the government for what they did to our children when they took them away from our families and put them in residential school. It broke the family circle. We were placed in a situation where we were to become like them, not as who we were as First Nations Indigenous people to the land. We were to give up our language, our culture, our dances, our songs, all of our ceremonies, 
that kept us strong, healthy, happy people. We were to forsake those things and become what we call white people. And at an early age in my life, as a mother, I couldn't imagine anyone taking my, our children away from us. And I thought, we need to ask the churches and the government to recognize what they did and to act on the apology by helping us heal. Our people were looking at themselves and wanting to know what happened and if they could deal with the issues and the trauma that happened to them, they would become well, healthy and happy again. And so the apology was I learned the purpose and I could feel my grandfather standing beside me when I asked for that apology, although he had gone to the other side years before, I realized that was my purpose. I think this church is very sacred because it was built by our people. The baptismal font was donated by my grandmother in memory of her husband, James Hovell, who was an elder in our church. That was donated by my mom in memory of her parents. And she explained to the artist that she wanted something that represented our way of life in the village, which would be the fishing and the water and the tumult, tumult of the water sometimes would be like turmoil in your life. And the moon represents the grandmother. And if you see on the mast of the boat is a cross. Five men in the water, they drowned. And so the family gave the cross as in memory of them. And one of them was my husband's younger brother. And so we have the candle, the cross, and the communion collection plates in memory of these five young men. This represents the cycle of life. The female rises up, lays the egg, and the male comes to uh, utilize and bring life to the egg. So it's a cycle of the male and the female of life of the salmon, but life of also people. Before the apology, we did not have any of this in our church. I wanted to show you the church because we are fisher people. The cycle of the salmon is very important, not only to us, but I think to the whole world. We need to take care of what is in the ocean. And we knew how to do that. Today, we can't make a living fishing in the ocean because of restrictions from the government, Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, we know how to take care of, of the ocean far more than they do, and I would like people to know that, yes. Yeah.
a lot of this began in, in the, somewhere shortly after 1976 when the Division of Mission in Canada in the United Church asked me if I would uh, do a study of First Nations people and the issues that they were dealing with within the parameters of the United Church. Uh, and I was interviewing some people like Stan Mackay and Don Robertson, who was tied in with education at Brandon University, and uh, other people, el elders in, in the uh, Manitoba area. And what they said is, we don't need to be studied again. What we need is to sit down and talk among ourselves. When the people started talking among themselves in this circle, I became aware that non-First Nations people were dominating a lot of the conversation and said, this is what we need to do, this is what we need to do. And so I suggested that all the non-First Nations people step out of the gathering and let the First Nations people talk among themselves. And when that happened, I went out with the non-First Nations people just to say, because I made the request, I will go out with you. But it produced a conflict in me, where should I reside? Because part of me is First Nations, part of me is not. And uh, so when I stepped out, I stepped out in conflict. The two things that we did recommend were, the, were theological training centers, where you had the Jesse Soto, the Francis Sandy, and the BC Consortium that came out of that, and the formation of the All Native Circle Conference. We gathered in uh, uh, Long Lake uh, prior to the General Council at uh, Laurentian uh, to talk about these things of education and uh, the All Native Circle Conference. In the middle of it, Bertabelli stood up and said, we need to demand an apology from the United Church of Canada. That kind of uh, threw things uh, into a little bit of confusion because some of the people didn't understand why we would demand an apology. Others uh, began to say, yes, we do need an apology. And so we had to consult with one another. And that took three or four days of really wrestling with what are we asking and what will that mean for us. Um, so the elders talked and talked and talked and, and finally we decided to affirm what Berta had asked us to do. And we asked Berta to be the speaker because she was the one that uh, felt that the apology was important. And for her, the apology at that stage centered around uh, culture and spirituality. There was a woman from out in Alberta, or not, her name was Alberta, but she was from British Columbia. Cape Moines Reserve, Father Alberta Billy. Yeah, and uh, she was wanting uh, an apology for the uh, in, uh, residential school system that the church had run. <clears throat> so the, finally it, uh, they came to me and they said, "Well, uh, will you uh, will you be uh, our trainer for the for the commissioners that are going to Sudbury to do this to get this uh, apology going?" And I said, "Well, I I don't know what I, I got to do, but I I will try and try and train them as well as I can." <laughs> They, I was a delegate, a uh, lay delegate, uh, in 1986 from Montreal and Ottawa Conference, Quebec Sherwood Presbytery. I was 38 years old. I was um, a, a mother of two teenage children. Um, I came out of a pretty um, middle-class uh, background and grew up in Quebec. Um, affiliated with the United Church of Canada, very involved in lay work. Um, so I think that was part of the reason why I was asked to be a delegate in Sudbury in 1986. Uh, while my family was uh, very encouraging of uh, good values around um, acceptance and inclusion, I also know I was handed some pretty, uh, uh, some racist uh, lenses to look at the world. My family home was not too far from the First Nations Reserve of uh, Ganawage. And uh, Ganawage uh, to, um, is part of an access to Montreal through, uh, drive through Ganawage to cross the Mercier Bridge to go to Montreal. 
And my father, uh, when we would take that that trip, he would say, he would say, be sure to lock the doors of the car when we drove through Ganawage. So the message I got was, you know, you need to be afraid of these people. Lock the doors. It's awful. I was there as a reporter for the United Church Observer. And it was my job to be with the kind of parallel council that was going on with First Nations people. So that was a wonderful place to be at that very historic general council. While the commissioners were doing the business of the church and uh, getting really ready to begin this historic apology, I was with a group of people who were talking about their place in the United Church. They were talking about the residential schools, which at that time were not much in the news. Uh, they were talking about the, um, with, with, with considerable pain, they were talking about the loss of their songs and their dances and many of the things that had suffered uh, because they had left their own spirituality behind to some degree and joined the United Church. So that was the context in which I was there. We drove down there from Saskatchewan that time, and it was a good gathering. A lot of our elders that were there are gone now, and but I remember uh, it seemed like it wasn't too long ago, and so many things have happened since that time. When we arrived in the afternoon, the men were putting up, the elders and the young men and older men were putting up the teepees. Then the elders were having a meeting not too far from where they were putting the teepees up. But I know there was a lot of, it was like it, uh, the east and the west weren't um, agreeing to to what was coming. I had a guy from Peterborough that was, he was the chairperson of putting near every committee that was going happening in Peterborough at that time. <laughs> and he was, he was one of the commissioners that was going to Sudbury. And I could not get him to th even think about giving an apology. He's all through the summer. Every meeting we had, he was always the guy that I was, had a, like a stick and a thorn in my chest. <laughs> the person who was offering some background uh, was talking about the apology, and, and one of the, of the delegates, who was um, uh, an ordained uh, a, a man, um, got very vocal in terms of his opposition to the, to the apology. And I, I really didn't understand exactly. He talked about how the apology might negate the work of the missionaries and, and their uh, good intentions, um, and that the apology would negate that in some way. I don't remember specifically uh, the details of the stories that were shared by First Nations people who came and asked for this apology. But I certainly un was able to understand uh, the hurt and um, uh, the longing for uh, a different kind of relationship within the church than the one that they had experienced. Uh, they talked about the experience of residential school. And frankly, that was the first I had ever heard about residential schools. I had no knowledge of residential schools up to that point. I was 38 years old. It was the first time I'd heard about residential schools. And I remember the women, just the looks on their faces were, um, I didn't, I, I, I got the, the impression of how hurt they were. Uh, by what was being said. So that was the first indication to me that uh, what we were being asked to do um, was not just a historical thing, but it, that connected on a deeply emotional level. 
And I went out after the meeting, and then I met with the women, and I and I just talked with them, and they were just, you know, so upset and shaking their heads, and um, I think not particularly looking forward to to what might else what else might be said um, in Sudbury, and you know, at that at that meeting that we gathered. So that was my first um, exposure to what was being asked of us. In 1986, at general council, I was. Uh, youth form delegate and I was about 17 at the time and I remember during uh, general council what um, in youth form we were in the court for part of the time and the other part of the time we were learning about things that were coming up on the agenda. In youth form we spent the time overnight on the Manitoulin Island with the elders. And we were billeted in different homes there. And then the next morning, they took us to Dreamer's Rock. One of the elders explained to us that Dreamer's Rock was where young people would go in order to receive a vision from the Creator as to what they were to do in their life. We were asked if we would walk in silence and about a hundred youth walking in silence. I don't think other than sleeping we had been silent until that point. And so it's a moment I'll never forget because it was very powerful. And we got to the top and we remained in silence and looked out and you could feel the sacredness of the place. I remember the general council meeting in Sudbury. Um, I wasn't a delegate, but they invited uh, our people to sit at the back uh, up to the point when uh, they were going to debate the possibility of giving an apology and then we were asked to leave so we left and we we went down the hill to a, like a parking lot area and um, and we waited there uh, and uh, not knowing what the decision of the general council would be one thing that was important was were the prayers for this evening from uh, Jim Dumont, who was a native elder from Sudbury. And um, he's actually the brother of Alf Dumont, and that's important too because Alf is an ordained United Church minister who went on to become very important in founding the All Native Circle Conference. Jim remained with the old ways. And so Jim was there that night offering these wonderful prayers. I believe it's the longest prayer I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> uh, I've, I don't know the exact time now, but I believe it, it, it was probably over an hour. But he prayed uh, in all of the directions, the four directions, and not only the four horizontal directions, but uh, to the sky and to the earth. So six directions in all, and, and each prayer was, was quite lengthy, but uh, it was a very gracious prayer and respectful prayer, and um, calling upon all of us to respect one another and to and to not, uh, and, and to show care for one another, no matter what decision is made. The uh, moderator at the time, Reverend Bob Smith, he um, began by asking his longing that we would arrive at a consensus, that we would all agree to uh, uh, offer the words of apology. And it became pretty clear and, and pretty qu quickly we learned that that was not going to happen. I remember in our table groups and in the court, there was a lot of questioning around why are we making an apology for something that our ancestors had done? How could we apologize for someone else? And, um, and I remember in my table group specifically, the conversation about why was this even on the agenda in the first place? And then the two of us who had just spent the day with the elders, started to share our story and what we had learned. 
And I remember how the atmosphere and attitudes around the table started to change. And so even though we didn't have voting power, we had speaking power. And, um, and I think that, at least in my table group, helped. And we were all lined up going up through the tables that were set up, set up in, the, in the conference room there at the, at the college. And just happened to be walking by this guy's table from Peterborough, the guy that was my, the thorn in my side all the way. <laughs> and when I was going by his table, he saw me and he jumped up. He came over and he threw his arms around me and he says, Murray, he says, I've changed my mind about this apology. He, he says, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> and he says, I, I just, it's just like he says, a, a big load has been lifted off my shoulders, right? When I, the, when as soon as I changed my mind that I could go along with this apology, he says, it just seemed like I was, a big load lifted right off my shoulders, Jesus. <laughs> I think that people who have not been confronted with the truth, I think that when they hear the truth, spoken with respect, um, and they hear it over and over, from people that they have come to love. Uh, because that's what happens in the church. You have people get to know each other and to, and, and to regard each other highly. When they, when they heard the truth of the residential schools, of, of the spirituality, that, of a very powerful spirituality, I think people's minds were changed, or perhaps more accurately, their hearts were opened. When we gathered at the sacred fire, and, and we waited, we waited into the night, I don't know how long you guys deliberated. Uh, it it was seemed almost 11 by the time we waited, finished. Yeah, uh, it was several hours of, of mm -hmm. deliberation. Mm -hmm. We kept the sacred fire going. Stan went in and talked to the elders in the teepee that we had set up. And the elders, we asked the elders, what should we do if the United Church did not give an apology? And the answer from the elders that Stan brought back to us at the fire was, we will dance. We will dance whether we are given an apology and we will dance if we are given an apology. But either way, we will dance. I don't know what happened in the deliberations. That's your memory, that's not my memory. Uh, I waited down below uh, and and we did sing and we danced and we talked and, and waited as patiently as we could uh, and the longer the deliberation went we knew that uh, you were uh, having to wrestle deeply with inside yourself mm -hmm. so uh, what happened <laughs> 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 well it's uh, I'm, fi I'm fascinated by the way uh, people's memory differs, and, and I'm going to suggest some slight differences. Uh, the General Council was not surprised by the request. In other words, we knew that, that this was something that we had to deal with, and as a result, uh, one of the, uh, what was it, 20-some sessional committees spent the entire time, all the, uh, allotted time, uh, of the of the council up to that night, debating uh, what we ought, what our response ought to be, and and crafting the uh, the essence. They crafted a resolution in, that, in the event that they were able to get it approved, would would uh, would be a, an apology. Now, <clears throat> like you, I had been. A member of the general council for a long time, and and uh, had had been aware of these things. I, I'm going to back up a bit, okay? And and uh, I have to be reminded 
at this stage of my life to stick with the main story, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, I had grown up in a minister's home. Uh, my father had been chair of the Board of Home Missions and had, res had responsibility for the work with Aboriginal people, and, and I, I had been raised from birth to be proud of the work that we did with Native people. And we, we gave our pennies, and we had missionaries come from God Lakes Narrow, God Lakes, Lake, God's Lake Narrows, and, and Bella Coola, and, and they told us wonderful stories, and we, and we gave our pennies. And, mm -hmm. But I had no idea what, <laughs> what, what, what I was doing when I spoke those words. I, 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 okay, back to the story. Right. Um, so we had that we had that preparatory um, time to to craft something, and a lot of work was done by the whole council. But it was difficult for the council to deal with, and we decided, as a matter of, um, we made the decision that that the the policy or the the way that we would debate that would be by consensus mm -hmm. we we would we would we would honor the tradition and we would come to a consensus mm -hmm. so uh, I announced this to the to the um, to the council and and then I called a called a break because I had to go to the toilet <laughs> And I was standing at the urinal, and a guy from, a professor from Prince Edward Island stood beside me, and he said, do you know anything about consensus? And I said, no. <laughs> so he explained what I had to do, that we, the, the, the idea that you would find out who was, who was adamantly opposed, and what would we have to change in order to bring them on board. So for, for the entire time of the discussion, mm -hmm. We were trying to craft a consensus, <laughs> and, mm. and we got we got to the uh, time that had gone on and on and on. And there were two people in that whole council who would not agree to this. Mm. <laughs> and as it had been as it had been uh, shaped, and and basically I said, "Well, that's enough. Enough. <laughs> we're enough for playing it their way. We're going to play it our way." And I called them. Well, I called the vote and it passed with me. They had the drum group there, which was a local drum group from Sudbury someplace. So as they, the Bob Smith was coming down the hill, they were singing a hymn, I think. I think they were singing some hill of hymn. I don't know if it was Amazing Grace, but they were singing a hymn. And as they get, came closer to the parking lot, then the drummers were singing. And we left the hall, and we went singing from that place where we were gathered. And we walked, and I remember it was going down a hill and a narrow path. <clears throat> and I could, as we came out of the hall, I could hear drums. It was the first time that I heard the drum, and it just uh, struck me deeply. Uh, they came down, Bob Smith went into the teepee, quite a large teepee, with 20 of the elders, and they stayed there, and what he was doing was offering the apology to them. And um, when that was over, he came out, repeated the apology as in my memory to everyone. I went down there and I had a little teepee that we borrowed from the daycare center here in Carve Lake. A little teepee, it's only about six feet high and <laughs> not very big around and I had about 12 old uh, elders in the, in, the, in the teepee and a fire in the middle. <laughs> So they, when the when the people got done with making the apology up in the in the college, they all came down to this parking lot and we we're all outside there, and we were, the 
moderator came into my little tent that I had, my teepee. And of course he's got his robes on and everything and, and I'm trying to keep his robes out of the fire. <laughs> and I didn't want him to, to want that to be said that we set the moderator on fire at the, at the apology. I believe it was Edith Memnook from uh, Goodfish Lake, Alberta, was the, the leading elder at that time, and, uh, and she's the one uh, who, who received it. But as, and she expressed in her own words and in her own language uh, to the moderator that, that we were happy, that we receive it, and that it was a historic moment uh, in the life of, of not only uh, First Nations people but the wider church for all people, that the apology is as important uh, for the non-Native church as it is for the Native church. And, uh, um, and so it, it was a very uh, moving moment. This is what uh, Bob Smith had read. Long before my people journeyed to this land, your people were here and you receive, receive from your elders an understanding of creation and of the mystery that surrounds us all that was deep and rich and to be treasured. We did not hear you when you shared your vision. In our zeal to tell you the good news of Jesus Christ, we were closed to the value of your spirituality. We confused Western ways and culture with the depth and breadth and length and height of the gospel of Christ. We imposed our civilization as a condition of accepting the gospel. We tried to make you be like us, and in so doing, we helped to destroy the vision that made you what you were. And as a result, you and we are poorer and the image of the Creator in us is twisted, blurred, and we are not what we were meant by God to be. We ask you to forgive us and to walk together with us in the Spirit of Christ so that our peoples may be blessed and God's creation healed. And then they began to dance. And of course, the commissioners joined the dance. It's very hard to do that dance if you don't know how to do it. And uh, so I'm trying to take pictures. It's dark. <laughs> and trying to get something that would be a visual record of this as well, not too successfully. And I remember the sounds of joy and deep pain all in one as the news was shared and, and um, tears and hugs and a sense of joy and, and pain together in that moment. There was a lot of tears shed and I remember asking some uh, people if, who were there sharing with us and uh, being a part of it all, if they were tears of joy or tears of sadness. And, uh, and I, some said joy and some said sadness. And joy because it finally happened. Sadness because it took so long. And sadness because they felt that so much damage has already been done that the people are, are so broken that it, at, almost at a point where to recapture or regain the teachings of the elders, it's almost too late. One of our leading elders, um, Edith Memnook, who, you know, went into the, the teepee and he, she, she talked on behalf of the elders there and she, they said to Robert Smith, Robert Smith that we are not ready to accept the apology because uh, it took 
but was it 500 years that Columbus first came to this country? And that was how many years it took us, you know, to be where we are as Native people. So it's going to take many years for us to gain back all that that hurt and that shame and blame and everything that, that went with, with that. And what I, I personally learned from that time was, was when we do something, it's not about making an apology to make things right. It's about making a covenant or a commitment to walk a different way. It's about choosing a different path. And so an apology is not a moment in time, but choosing a new path and a new journey. To me, it was like finally um, it took away, I guess, all that shame of being an Indian, of what the church said was not good for us. And for me, it felt like I I can be proud of who I am. And and I think I just I just cried there in during and and I think you know the the whole um gathering you could just feel the holy spirit. And it was you could sense that the holy spirit was there working amongst us uh healing us uh supporting us and for me, that, that was what I experienced, and I'll never forget that, because I can remember my grandfather saying, someday our culture is going to come back, our tradition is going to come back. I wanted to throw in another thing that happened at the fire. Mm -hmm. When I finished reading the apology to the, to the larger group, again, there was silence. And Art Solomon, who had a huge voice, <laughs> shouted out, Now, what in the hell are they going to do about it? <laughs> and, uh, and so that's where, that's where, that's a challenge that has shaped the rest of my life. Right, yeah. right. Because, because apologies are meaningless. I was going to say Harper's apology is meaningless because he has not only not put into work the, the, the programs that were already in place, but he's cut them out. He's cut them out. Yeah. And so that, that, those words are absolutely devoid of meaning. And mm -hmm. so we are constantly required as a church to live of the apology. Yeah. The following morning, as we came in from the motel where we uh, had been living, or, or, or where we'd been sleeping, we passed the area where the uh, the apology had been extended and the uh, the celebration had taken place. Um, it was a dull, very misty morning. Uh, it reminded me of uh, uh, a typical Scottish morning in the Highlands. And I got to thinking about these rocks, which the folks had brought from across the country to be part of this general council. And I said to my wife, Anne, wouldn't it be great if we could keep these rocks here after general council has concluded and build some sort of cairn uh, in memory of this event? Well, cairns have a, a long and varied uh, history and uh, several different uses, but the one that sticks in my mind is that in the, the days of yore when the clans were warring with one another, when the warriors were going off to uh, a battle, they would each carry a rock to the head of the glen where the, the, the clan lived and deposit the, the stones in, uh, in a pile there. After the battle, when they returned, they would pick up their rock and go home. The remaining rocks served as a memorial to those who had died in that battle. So with this kind of image in my mind, I thought, well, I, we can maybe make use of these rocks as some sort of memorial cairn. 
So being on the Agenda and Planning Committee, I said to my colleagues that morning, I said, wouldn't it be a good idea if we could gather these rocks and uh, build a, a cairn here at uh, Laurentian University down in the parking lot? They thought it was a good idea. We had a motion passed that morning at General Council, and um, that was the beginning of the building of the cairn. We piled the rocks into the wheelbarrow and stored the rocks in the furnace room at Huntington University so that further uh, planning could, could take place. That was them safely out of the way till, uh, till plans were developed. Uh, I thought, in my simple, naive mind, all we'd do was pile up the 12 rocks and, and there would be the cairn. Not so. Uh, we managed to engage the services of Art Solomon. Now, Art Solomon in a, is an Anishnabek elder, but also a very skilled stonemason. Art, uh, with some other folks from Sudbury Presbytery, began to design a platform or site in which to build the cairn. Well, after that base was done, we had to hunt up rocks because Art, being the skilled stonemason and architect that he was, um, decided we need to have some native rock from the uh, r reservations uh, around here. So we went to Whitefish First Nation uh, and I think Meeching First Nation and we brought rocks from there. And it was with art that I actually learned to split rocks with a hammer and chisel, a skill uh, which I haven't used much since then, but it was an interesting thing to, to learn. The project, um, which was given permission in 86, didn't actually get concluded until two years later, uh, 88. I remember a youth group in Montreal at a Montreal, uh, Montreal and Ottawa conference one year, and um, they had invited me to just come and sit with the youth. And the youth had said, uh, well, what's the most important story you ever did? And I, I thought, oh. And then I said, well, it was the apology in 1986. Uh, this would be maybe uh, 10 or 15 years later. And they said, oh, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we talked and uh, it was amazing they uh, they were filled with indignation that that their church had not acted better before the apology. They were, they were, in that wonderful way of youth, they, they recognized the way things ought to be and, and um, had a vision of it. So, and I think that that apology and the one that came later, because um, that apology was to Native congregations, I think that prepared the way for the, uh, revision to our creed, to live with respect in creation. Even though that came out of Toronto Conference, it came out of a recognition of something in Native spirituality that we had not been able really to grasp before. So, um, whatever it meant to First Nations, the challenge that they brought back as a result of that apology to live it out, I think that that has changed our church. And I hope it will continue to change our church. I talked to people who were involved in residential schools uh, in recent years, and I, I've talked to them about what we understand now. And, and the very confusing thing about humans, I think, is that we do things out of love that are evil. And, and the really, uh, in some ways, tragic, but also amazing things for me is that many, many people who were on staff in the residential school were loving people. They were loving, and they believed that their duty was to make us something else, in love. So the basic philosophy that I believe is alive in Canada uh, under the... Indian Act and under the, uh, the work of the churches, still believing somewhere deep in their subconscious, indigenous peoples must be made differently, 
in order to be of any worth. That means that people can come under some impetus of mission, to do mission, with love, and be about the business of trying to make us something other than we are. I think every parent, in some ways, faces that same conflict of wanting your child to do what you want them to do, to be who you want them to be. Your expectations superimposed upon your children or your school class, uh, influencing, affecting, and sometimes causing great pain for them because they're not going to be what you want them to be. I think we as Indigenous have suffered that paternalism in a very, very um, mysterious way. Motivated by love, we've been strangled. Many loving people in the church, as Bob Smith was saying earlier in the interview, he was, he was saying, we gave our pennies to, to promote mission. And when you're totally, totally immersed in the idea that the church is about the good works of liberation and love, then this under layer of motivation to make people something other than what they are, somehow unworthy in God's sight until you make them into something else. That Canadian thinking pattern is not just in the church. It's in government policy. It's in, I believe it's still in the educational systems of our country. The schools in the country are either run by the churches to form people in their image through the church influence in the classroom or through the general education, public education, is still often about meeting certain standards so you can be adversarial, aggressive, successful as individuals, not as communities, as individuals, to rise up out of the masses and, and be successful. So, so that mental set, in my mind, has been bought into by the churches. It is the way of life in, in North America. It's the way materialism works. And, and people like Alberta Billy have helped awaken me. It's taken me 30 years to try to understand what she was really saying. And uh, when I recently heard her tape that that's a part of the series, I was reinvigorated by her initial call and her consistency in saying we are respectful, faithful people. And we want to be engaged in respectful ways with this healing process. The healing isn't just for Indigenous. It's not just for us. It's for the churches. It's for the society. And ultimately, it's a global reality. Our relationship with creation is broken. Our relationship with each other is fragmented. This kind of conversation about the apology is really about the philosophy of life. And I cry out as an indigenous Cree person that we as Cree people on the land know something about the fullness of life. When we say pemat disewin in our language, we mean fullness of life. And that always meant the best hunter gave away most of what he brought back. The mothers in the village cared for everyone and we're about food distribution, about a loving community, about caring for everyone. We knew so much about what is gospel in our communities, and I grew up knowing that. So how did I ever forget? I went to school, and I was taught. I was programmed to be successful, to be adversarial, Look out for number one. And um, I struggle with that every day.